welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, together with my co-host, Bethany Ruff. Hello, hello. Welcome back to the show. And we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. Dr. Chelsea Durda is a chiropractor who practices at the Atlanta Natural Health Clinic in Georgia. She uses a wide variety of tactics and adjusting techniques to meet each client's specific needs. Although she works with a wide range of clients of all ages and genders, her passion lies in helping pregnant women, infants, and children. She is the podcast host of Fueling Her, A Woman's Guide to Wellness, which she hosts with Dr. Juan Michelle Martin. The podcast is all about health, wellness, and empowering women. They cover a wide range of topics, including pregnancy and childbirth, health and fitness, business and entrepreneurship, and more. In her free time, Dr. Durda enjoys giving keynote speeches, painting, and doing all kinds of fun things outside. Dr. Chelsea Durda, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you guys so much for having me. I want you to think about that line. She enjoys giving keynote speeches. <laughs> First of all, nobody invites us to do keynote speeches. So there, that's one right there. And <laughs> what is so <laughs> enjoyable about giving a keynote speech? <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, Casey, it, that's a great question. I feel like there is so much knowledge out there that needs to be shared. And I have been given a gift that I want to share it with people. And so the more people I can share it with at once, the better. And doing that on stage is a particular high that you can't understand until you are in that moment. Mm. I feel like it's like, you get knowledge, you get knowledge. The Oprah of (laughs) sharing information. That's how I feel on stage. So it is an incredible gift. Has it been a rough year uh, not having access to that as you normally would? (laughs) Yes, but that is also why I started a podcast with my wonderful (laughs) podcast partner, Dr. J. That's awesome. awesome. Well, um, it's a great show. It's how we came into contact with you. um, And I'm really glad you guys are doing it. I really want to talk about that. Um, Before we get there, I'd love to hear about yourself and when you decided to help people through chiropractic work. Yeah, awesome question. So I actually grew up not feeling particularly well. I had really severe, quote unquote, seasonal allergies that really were not seasonal allergies and always was a little heavier than my peers, not obese per se, but didn't feel like I fit in. And I definitely didn't have high energy. My energy level was never what it should have been for a child my age. And I feel like it really affected me um, in a positive way now that I'm an adult because it forced me to be very interested in learning as opposed to sports. I spent a lot of time reading books inside and really developing my mind for a long time. And my mom, thankfully, was an operating room nurse for 30 years. And she would come home telling these incredible stories about what the human body is capable of and how miraculous it is structured, how perfectly we are designed and how everything fits together. So from a young age, I thought, oh my gosh, of course I have to work in healthcare. I love kids. So I thought, oh, maybe the best thing for me is to be like a pediatric cancer surgeon. Surely that's where I can do the most good for the world. And then as a high school student, I had the opportunity to go into surgery with her a couple of times and realized a couple of things. The first being, I'm not interested in being in a situation where I could potentially make a mistake and accidentally kill someone that wasn't comfortable for me. Hmm. And it just didn't seem like it made sense that we were treating these issues that could be prevented, like heart disease and diabetes. Like it broke my heart to see amputations of limbs of diabetics and heart surgeries when These are things that easily could have been prevented. And I had an opportunity to go visit my uncle, who's also a chiropractor. His office was very far from my house, never got to see it until I was 18. And I got to spend one day in the office with him. And he said, you know, Charles, the body heals itself. And that blew my mind. I immediately was thinking, why is this not the foundation of our healthcare system? If the body is is capable of healing itself, Why don't we focus on the healing and wellness and prevention instead of treating disease? You know, the World Health Organization's definition of health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. 
And I really strongly believe that we have massively made a mistake in how we've structured our healthcare system. And a lot of that comes from the fact that medicine is taught one, is taught one thing, but also that the population as a whole is not taught the basics of their own anatomy, let alone how to maintain their health. So that's a pretty serious issue. And until that changes, I have to keep speaking up and sharing the message and teaching people what they don't know. So I'm thankful for people like y'all who do the same. <laughs> Absolutely. We couldn't agree more. I think, um, I think if people started addressing the root cause, um, they would be feeling a lot better, but nobody would be making any money. And that's kind of a problem. <laughs> um, what were some of the things you were finding as you were practicing? Like what, what were some of the techniques or tricks that, that you learned could really actually help people? Awesome question. Well, the first thing is I will, because I'm more interested in kids, I started looking at, okay, how can I help kids better? And I started looking at, okay, well, diet is plays a massive role in how we function. You know, the fuel that you put in your tank depend, determines how your car will run. So if you're putting unleaded fuel in a sports car, it's not going to run the way it's supposed to. And it's the same for how we fuel our bodies, what we put into our bodies. So diet is a big one. But I started looking at these families and saying, okay, well, your child has this developmental disorder. They really need to get off dairy. They really need to get off gluten so that it improves their neurological condition, decreases their inflammation. And the parents would look at me and say, that's great, Dr. Chelsea, but there's no way we can do that. And it really comes down to how stressed mom is. So I really started looking at, okay, what's going on with women's health? Why are women so burnt out? Why are women so overwhelmed, so inundated with things in their everyday lives? that they don't have the adaptability, they don't have the flexibility to make these critical health changes for their children. Um, so diet is a big one. Neurological health is another. That's something that we don't really talk about. It's kind of one of those weird things that you don't learn unless you see a chiropractor or maybe certain kinds of therapists. And if you think about it, your brain and your nervous system control every single function in your body so that you stay alive, moving and functioning at hopefully your best. And no one teaches you how to do that in a way that you're taken care of. Does that make sense? Yeah, perfect sense. Absolutely. I think, I think men are guilty of this too, but women, especially just, there's so much responsibility that they, they tend to do so much, which is great, but it's so easy to get burned out. And then you can't take care of other people if you're not taking care of yourself. Is that what you were finding? Absolutely. My number one message is put your own oxygen mask on first. You know, mm. we operate from this idea that we can go, go, go all the time, especially modern day women. And again, like you said, men do it too. But women in particular are now told, well, you have to be a career woman, you have to be a mom, and you also have to do all these things on the side. And that leads to so many things occupying your time. But we forget about the basics. We forget that we're supposed to drink water. We consider sleep to be a commodity when it's actually the most important thing for our health. We consider exercise to be a luxury. And that's one of the most critical things we need for our health. You know, these basic things are nutrition that are essential and we treat them like, well, I'll do that later. I don't have time for that. When really these, those are the things you don't have time not to embrace. Mm. Yeah. I love that. I'll often ask people like, how long do you want to be taking care of people? Because if you're out, you're not going to have that opportunity any longer. Um, you mentioned diet and I find this super interesting. I think, I think most people realize by now that sugar and flour, things I've heard you talk about are not, they're not great for, you know, weight loss or fat loss, things like that. Most people know you need to get those out. Can you talk a little bit about the diet, you know, including sugar and flour and how people move? Cause I don't think a lot of people make that connection. Yeah, absolutely. So sugar and flour are both extremely, extremely pro, pro inflammatory, which means that they cause massive amounts of inflammation in the body as well as feeding things in our body that are not good for us, like what we think of as quote unquote bad bacteria, more pathogenic type bacteria like E. coli, C. diff, yeast, um, as well as feeding cancer cells. And that inflammation 
also causes us to lay down fat cells in our abdomen. And we know that abdominal fat is one of the biggest indicators for someone being at a higher risk for a heart attack or systemic diseases. Because we put our fat cells are great for isolating and storing chemicals. So if there's something that is put, if you have leaky gut, quote unquote, and things leak out of your intestines into the surrounding tissue, the body says, hey, I'm going to put down fat because that's how I'm going to absorb these chemicals. It's like putting sand on an oil spill so that then I don't have to worry about these chemicals ending up in other more critical tissues. And that's why people have trouble losing that last 20 to 30 pounds because these fat cells are holding chemicals that are really hazardous for your body that you've taken in in processed food and all other areas of our lives. So to circle back, um, historically, sugar was available in very small amounts. You know, foraging people might have been able to find some honey or get some maple syrup from a tree or get very small amounts of sugar with plant fiber, like in sugar cane or in different kinds of fruit. But now that we've isolated it chemically and physically, it's bleached, it's processed, it removes the fiber, removes all the vitamins that might be associated with that, and it's separate from the original plant. So you can consume very large amounts of sugar without getting full. And on top of that, there are still people who don't realize that processed sugar like high fructose corn syrup, corn sugar, things like that, and chemical sugar substitutes like even aspartame are not actually sugar at all anymore. And they're extremely toxic for your body. Um, so that's sugar itself. Flour, on the other hand, <laughs> is a whole different mess. And there's a lot of theories as to what made gluten and specifically wheat flour allergenic for people. Some of it, it has to do with the, flour, the wheat being genetically modified. Some of it has to do with the pesticides we use. Some of it has to do with the actual processing procedure that involves the wheat being left in warehouses and it gets mold and mildew. Then we bleach it to remove the mold and mildew. So it's palatable, meaning we want to eat it. And then we add the vitamins back in, but we might not be able to absorb those vitamins because they've been chemically added instead of being part of the original food. It's so, so interesting. for example, people, so are people with gluten sensitivity you can go to Europe, for example, and they don't have any trouble eating uh, wheat foods in Europe because they haven't gone through some of the same things that we do here in the United States. Mm. Wow. That's so interesting. You're, t you're talking about chemicals. I, I have to ask what about, um, you know, vegetable oil, seed oils. That's one of the first things I think of when I think of toxic crap with a lot of chemical. Is that something you notice as well? If people are consuming a high amount of vegetable oil, it's affecting their movement. Yeah, definitely. And for a lot of reasons. Um, one of them is we don't think about the fact that if you get something that's fried in a restaurant, especially chain restaurants, they usually don't completely empty the vat of oil that they're frying things in. So if you get an order of French fries at a chain restaurant, there's a very good chance that the oil that they're using to fry those is months, if not years old, and it is completely dead. It's been heated and cooled and had things added to it over and over and over again, where it's not just not a food anymore, but it's severely a toxin. And I would highly encourage folks to go and listen to the interview that you guys did with Dr. Chris Kenobi for more information about that, because it blew my mind. I was really enjoying listening to the depth of the, the history of these oils and just that omega-6 to omega-3 balance. So if you have no idea what I'm talking about, definitely recommend going back and listening to that episode because it is rich with information. Mm, thank you. Do you find that as far as how the way that someone's eating affects their physical state? I notice with my clients, if I have someone that I know is eating more of a refined carbohydrate or higher sugar diet, they almost, because, you know, there's the twice the amount of neurons in your, your gut and your, as your brain, there's almost that disconnect between brain and body. And so it's, it's almost more difficult with that person to find what the true root of their pain is coming from because there's just, there's so much inflammation. Do you, do you yes. have any personal accounts of that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Bethany, I could write a book about that. 
I can't wait uh, to read so it. So <laughs> I will say this. People don't even realize how sick, how inflamed they are until they start making some of these health changes and moving away from the standard American diet. I know I certainly didn't. I mean, I had a positive outlook even when I was very sick, but, and I, I thought this is just my life. This is my energy level. This is just who I am. I'm just not built the way other people are built. That's a complete fallacy. You have no idea what your body is capable of. And when you start removing some of these toxins, your body reconnects, you start feeding your body, you start feeding your cells, your happy hormones are produced in your gut. And now you have more energy. Now you have more motivation. Now you're excited. Now your mood is better. You're ready to induce these movements and you have more flexibility. So when something stresses you out, you're not immediately running to the kitchen for a sugary snack. Instead, you're thinking, okay, what can I do that will make me feel even better? And I'm sorry, I didn't do ab exercises for 15 years. I mean, I re distinctly remember being a teenager and feeling absolutely like I was going to be sick trying to do any kind of sit-ups or, curl or curls or anything like that because my stomach was so full all wow. the time. You know, the average American is extremely constipated, and this is something that people don't like to talk about, but even if you're using the restroom every day and having bowel movements, there's a very good chance that your intestines are backed up, and that alone makes someone more tired, less likely to go running. Not to mention, Bethany, on the other hand, that most people are overstressed. The average American rates their stress level at a 7 out of 10 or higher. And when we're in that chronic sympathetic state, meaning we're stressed out all the time, your body is going to prioritize blood flow to your heart, your brain, your lungs, and your limbs, and your digestion is left on the side. So then you're not absorbing nutrients properly. You're not getting the same amount of energy from your food. You're going to crave sugar. You're going to be tired. And when you try to exercise, it's going to feel like work. It's going to feel really hard instead of feeling good. And all of these together contribute to changes in people's motion, making them more likely to be inactive. Wow, that's such a good explanation. Tell me, tell me if you've ever heard this story. So my old car had a horribly, horribly loud exhaust system. It was terrible. You could hear me coming five miles away, super embarrassing. I didn't like it. And I figured that maybe there was a problem with the exhaust, but rather than do anything about it, I turned up the radio so my podcast would be louder so I could hear them. <laughs> Does that sound familiar at all? Absolutely. So I, and I can speak to that as well. We base our priorities on what gives us the fastest dose of adrenaline and endorphins. And I'm guilty of it too. Uh, I love getting adjusted. That's the thing that has made the biggest difference for my health is being under chiropractic care. But the thing that motivates me to tell my office mate, hey, I really need an adjustment. Can we trade right now? is something starts to hurt. And that's so silly because I get adjusted once a week. It's part of my wellness care. It's going to happen anyway. But even within a particular day, the day that I have an appointment for myself, it's driven by, ooh, something doesn't feel right. And I think a lot of that has to do with we're in such a high octane, high intensity society. We're go, go, go all the time. We're not thinking past their to do list. And even when our self-care is part of our to-do list, the motivators usually come from, I don't feel good. And that can include exercise. Like I'm going to go work out because I'm not happy with the way my body feels, or I'm not happy the way, with the way my body looks. I'm going to go to bed earlier because I'm tired versus because it's good for me. I'm going to eat something healthy because I feel like I'm kind of backed up. I feel like my system's not clearing. Maybe I've developed a rash because I'm not eating foods that are good for me, or I've developed eczema or developed allergies. You know, our motivators are usually based in not feeling good. And it's sad, but it's kind of the reality. And I think a lot of that comes from that chronic stress state and the priorities of life in the fast lane. Mm. 
Yeah. <laughs> also very well explained. Um, so, so 2020 happens, uh, you know, we have the pandemic, people have to go inside and we started noticing a few months after that whole thing started that people were, were hurting more than they were before and in different ways. And I wonder what things you've learned as the year has gone on about people working from home, um, not necessarily designed to be their primary workspace. You know, my laptop set up at the kitchen table, like it's not, not exactly the most ideal posture. What things have you noticed this year specifically that people are having issues with as they're working from home? Yep. There's three major categories. Um, the first one is posture. The second one is non-exercise activity. And the third one is lack of energy. So posture is a really big one. People don't realize this. But when you're working on your laptop or your cell phone, your head is bent down at an angle where it's effectively like hanging a 45 pound weight around your neck. Tell me that has more impact than just causing neck pain. Wow. But if I could tell you the length of sequela, the length of symptom pathways that ripple effect from that, it is significant. Everything from muscle spasms in the neck, poor posture, shallow breathing, fatigue, poor digestion. I mean, I'm seeing pelvic stiffness in elementary school children that I shouldn't even see until they're at least in high school. Wow. That's major, Casey. That's major. And not to mention the impact that that has on the nervous system. You know, at least 80% of the function of our brain is generated by movement. So that doesn't have to mean that you're exercising all day, every day, but we have something called NEAT or non-exercise activity that is the motion we do just passively going through our day. You know, for kids, it might be walking to the bus, getting on and off the bus, walking in between classes, walking to the lunchroom. Yes, it includes physical education, but also just that up and down, bringing something to the teacher's desk. And when we don't have that and we're limited just to the boundaries of our house or worse for people in apartments, that significantly limits the amount of that non-exercise activity that we're getting. And that has a lot of sequelae as well, including poor circulation of our lymphatic system, which removes toxins from our cells and removes waste products. There's so many things, circulation that go with that. Um, So a lot that goes into that so many, so many cascades that are attached to it. And just the fact that when we're not moving, we're not moving, you know, that whole old adage from physics that an object at rest stays at rest. When you're sitting all the time, you're not going to take the initiative to get up and move the way you would. And all of those things together really have an impact on our mental state. That's a lot of what contributes to the depression, the anxiety, both in terms of how your posture affects your nervous system and the shallow breathing that comes with it. There are so many things attached to it that we're going to see the effects of people be working from home for years to come. Mm, I totally agree. I mean, the posture you're describing, it sounds really protective, like a, like a trauma posture is it, it, that's similar, right? Yes, absolutely. And they've done research studies on that forward flex posture, the rounded shoulders. And if you think about it, If you look up, I want everybody listening right now to just look up. It is really hard to frown and look up. It is natural when your head is looking towards the sky to smile. If you're looking down, smiling is much more difficult. That alone has such an impact on mood and anxiety, but Breathing has a lot to do with it too. So when we're flexed forward, you're severely decreasing your lung capacity. You're severely decreasing the ability of your lungs to expand and you're training your nervous system that this is the full amount that my lungs can inflate. So even when you are sit standing up straight, moving, exercising, whatever, you have less lung capacity as a result and scar tissue that goes with it, which also feeds into anxiety. Because the body hears, oh, there's less lung capacity. Now I am breathing more shallow. Now I'm breathing more quickly. Clearly, I'm under stress. Clearly, there's a threat to me because I shouldn't be breathing this fast unless I'm being chased by a predator. 
So there are so many cascades associated with that as well. Wow. I'm sitting here like nodding to myself and trying to smile and frown. That really works. That's crazy. (laughs) I was laughing over here. I was thinking to myself, like, I don't know how many SCMs I've released in the last like eight months. It's crazy. (laughs) Yes. Wow. Well, so 2020 happened and I'm sure all your events got canceled and your keynotes kind of went away, but you decided to do the podcast. So tell me how that kind of started when you started talking about that and um, when you thought that would be an option for you. Yeah, great question. So Dr. J and I have been friends for a long time. She's a pelvic floor physical therapist, huge women's health advocate, especially in the birth world. And the two of us talk shop all the time. And I think she approached me and said, you know, you're really nerdy about this. I'm really nerdy about this. I think we need to get this information out there because we're both frustrated with, especially perinatal and postpartum care, Men may have no idea that this is a thing, but women get a significant amount of care before their birth. It's usually focused on baby. It sometimes rules out different things for mom's health. Like, okay, we need to make sure that you're not going to have a stroke. We need to make sure that you're not developing gestational diabetes. We need to make sure that the baby's not going to get stuck during labor but it's not necessarily focused on her health, maintaining her health. It's just making sure, okay, nothing's going to go wrong. But then after the baby is born, you get a six week checkup and occasionally you get a three month checkup unless you're working with a midwife or an alternative healthcare provider. But in most obstetric offices, hospital setting, what have you, there are those two postpartum checkups and that's it. Wow. The blood work is very limited. The physical care is very limited. I mean, a C-section is in major abdominal surgery. And in six weeks, we tell women, okay, you're ready to go back to your normal function without any kind of rehab, without any kind of hormone panels. And it took your body nine months to grow a human, whether you have a natural birth or you have a C-section. There's a lot of changes that happen associated with that that we need to then respond to and give the body time to respond to that we just, A, don't have maternity leave for, and B, the care is not there and it's often not covered by insurance. So there are a lot of things that go into disparity in postpartum care. And unfortunately, there's also a massive racial disparity in what that looks like. Um, African-American women in the United States are four times more likely to die either during childbirth or in the first year postpartum because of even racial disparities in wow. that postpartum care. Wow. So there's a lot to unpack. <laughs> and we said, hold on, someone <laughs> needs to provide this information. So we started doing it. And it's been so incredible. I'm so thankful that we've done it. That's awesome. So are we. Um, you guys do a great job covering a wide range of topics uh, ha- that have to do with women's health. And obviously, I can't experience a lot of those things as a male, but it's so important for me to learn about. Not only do I work with women, but it just helps understand you know, the different things that I'll never go through that you guys go through all the time. And so I would love to unpack some of the things that you've learned along the way. We, we found that we also just are thrilled to interview people like you all over the world, and we learn all kinds of stuff all the time. And it's super, super fun. So yeah, I just wanted to unpack a few things that you've learned along your journey. Um, I guess I want to get started with um, preparing for pregnancy. I think this is something that a lot of women have questions about. What are things that that women should be thinking about if they are, are thinking about getting pregnant? Yeah. Awesome question. Well, the first one is that some, for most women in the United States, getting pregnant takes a long time. And by that, I mean, it's the average is roughly a year and a half to two years. And something that's not discussed enough is that fertility issues, meaning that people have trouble conceiving, are 50% male. And quite often it's blamed on the female body, Um, but taking care of your own body is also very important. So issue number one, as a chiropractor, pelvic rotation. Um, sitting is the biggest cause of stiffness of your tailbone, your sacrum, and your tailbone is supposed to do a figure eight. When you take two steps, if you sit all day, every day, there's a very significant chance that it does not. And that means that your uterus is going to be under more tension. 
egg can be uh, contorted. That causes a lot of implantation issues for women, as well as putting pressure on the ovaries, on the ovarian tubes, uh, in addition to causing, being more likely to cause things like endometriosis or exacerbate them. So that's one thing. Another thing is that you should be supplementing with prenatal vitamins for at least six months before you plan to get pregnant, especially folic acid. You want to make sure you have an adequate supply in your system for yourself, as well as an excess that will then benefit your baby. Um, Omega-3s are something that we see as being deficient in 90% of pregnant women that's a massive issue, you know, going back to the oil conversation. <laughs> if you're deficient in omega-3s, your baby's brain is not going to develop appropriately. That is a problem. Mm. Uh, so those are those are the big ones for me. Gotcha. Wow. And I, this is just so ignorant of me, like as a man, to not think that 50% of the issue with people not getting pregnant could be the male. Like that's, yeah, that's how barbaric we are as men. What can men be thinking of doing to improve fertility? The same thing women are doing. You really need to look at your nutrition. You need to look at your exercise. I mean, we really don't talk about sperm quality except to talk about sperm motility, but a man's DNA is contributing 50% of the DNA for that child. You really need to look at what am I putting in my body? How am I treating my body? And how does that affect my genetic expression? Am I producing a high quality offspring potential or not? And that's usually falls more on the woman um, because no offense, uh, men tend to be a little more reactive about their health versus proactive. Again, it goes back to how male and female brains are wired and priorities but that definitely makes a difference. So I would highly encourage you to be looking at your own nutrition status and taking good care of yourself. That's awesome. That's great advice. I love that. What, what things change as the woman becomes pregnant? Because I hear oftentimes like, oh, now I'm eating for two or, you know, there, there might be like, I can't exercise anymore um, because, because I'm carrying a child. What, what things have to change for most women once they I become mean, pregnant? Yeah, great question. Uh, I'm going to answer that carefully because I'm not an obstetrician. So take this with a grain of salt. Um, the biggest thing is your stress level. You know, among the many things that can contribute to the development of autism in a child is maternal stress, particularly if that child is a male, um, and because stress increases a woman's testosterone level. And you would think that would be good for a male child, but it in fact, it's not good for the developing brain of an infant. Um, so that's a big one. I also think there's still an old wives tale and a lot of confused people and practitioners encouraging women not to exercise at all during pregnancy. And that is the absolute worst thing for you. Um, I'm not telling you to go and join a CrossFit gym when you find out you're pregnant, but mobility Again, circulation, lymphatic drainage, health of the mom in general, as well as removing toxins is essential. So I love dance, yoga, because those are things that are encouraging your hips to move the way that they're supposed to. Walking is also great, but there's nothing that says women who have a healthy exercise routine should stop exercising. Please don't do that. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, and nutrition is another big one. You know, I, I, I'm a, I'm eat a very paleo ish diet that tends more towards vegetarian. And there are some very distinctive things that I eat that require a longer digestive process because I eat very heavily plant-based and a lot of women will find that again, as their bodies change, they're not able to process their food the same way, especially if they're stressed on top of it. And now they're getting constipated and that constipation is contributing to their nausea and some of their happy foods, like for me, it's eggs are now making them feel sick either because of the smell or the texture or something along that line. They're not able to rely on that. And they end up just eating pure carbohydrates all the time because it's something that feels good. So just being mindful about the changes your body's going through. If you need to add a fiber supplement, things that will help your body process your food, digestive enzymes, probiotics, prebiotics, 
so that you're not having these digestive issues so that you can continue to nourish your body. Mm, gotcha. Wow. So you mentioned stress. I didn't know that about um, autism. That is super, super interesting. And I wasn't very aware of this until a few years ago when somebody, you know, I think it was a podcast I was listening to made me more aware. Tell me if this sounds stressful. Going in to a giant building of kind of stale air that smells like chemical products and <laughs> fluorescent lights and forceps pulling a baby out of the womb and then getting placed into some plastic box three rooms over, like that doesn't sound like the most stress-free start to life. Um, and so I'm so glad that you had an episode, which I loved, which was all about natural birth options. Can you explain a little bit what that might look like for somebody who wants to explore that? Yes, and I'm gonna add on top of that, because I'm an empath, for those who are sensitive, being in an environment where people are sick and dying, because that's usually why people go to a hospital. Um, so even the energetic effect of that on a mom. So mm. yes, uh, being outside of your comfort zone. And I think something that's not talked about a lot is you think, you know, you people watch movies and they think, oh, when I'm in labor, I'm going to have the nurses there all the time to help me. And the doctor is going to come in when it's necessary. In most hospital settings, that's not how birth goes. You and your partner are usually left to labor alone for a very long time. So there's a lot to unpack there, but I think it's really important to at least consider a home birth, an assisted home birth with a midwife or a birth center birth, because those are things that are more honoring to the labor process. There was a, an English king who wanted to watch his wives give birth. And it is a very sick story. Um, if you're really interested, go research it. Wow. But that's when we started encouraging women to give birth on their back. And again, as a chiropractor, mobility-wise, that doesn't make any sense in terms of the way the body changes during labor. There's something that happens, uh, I believe it's called the triangle of Michaelis, when you're at a certain phase of labor, the sacrum actually dislocates and to create space for the emerging baby. And if a woman is giving birth on her back, that there's a very strong chance that that won't happen. Labor becomes more difficult. So that in addition to continuous fetal monitoring, having tubes and IVs, having an epidural and then not being able to move, these are all things that a contribute to pain during labor, but also contribute to prolongation of labor, increase the C-section rate. And we have a significantly higher C-section rate in the United States than anywhere else in the world, which is completely backwards considering we have one of the most advanced healthcare systems. Um, so there's, there's a lot of issues you can unpack around birth and that's, that's a whole podcast series by itself. But I think things that women need to consider, families need to consider when they're looking at birth is why would I give birth in a hospital? Is it necessary for me to give birth in a hospital? Am I able to give birth somewhere else? And what are the risks and benefits for me as a person and for us as a family? You know, energetically in terms of healthcare choice, in terms of comfort in the environment, in terms of being encouraged to make choices that feel right for your family. There are so many things. Um, so I would encourage anyone who's having any questions at all about having a baby, which should be everyone who's having a baby, to hire a doula. There is a significant amount of research that doulas help improve labor times. They help decrease pain during labor. And most importantly, they help families make informed choices about their healthcare decisions. Even if that choice is, yes, I'm going to do every single thing that I'm being told by my obstetrician and the hospital and the labor and delivery nursing staff, but I'm choosing to make that decision versus being blindsided by choices I didn't even know I had to make or that because I'm in a certain setting that I can't make. What kinds of postpartum movement practices would you recommend for a brand new mom? Obviously with that sacrum needing to dislocate to create more space, the pelvis is kind of out of alignment. 
and she can't necessarily go back to maybe her yoga class or Pilates class right afterwards. What are some things that she could do on her own to kind of get things back into position? Yeah, I, I think that's an ongoing conversation, Bethany, because I think we need to rewrite the dialogue around that. Um, because ideally, in a perfect world, every mom would see a pelvic floor therapist and a chiropractor after delivery because her pelvis is out of alignment and that's changing her neural connection in that regard. And her muscles have changed quite a bit because she pushed out a human uh, or had a human surgically removed from her body. So there is a significant amount of neurological, uh, circulatory and muscular changes that occur with that. So having the appropriate rehab with a pelvic floor therapist and having the appropriate alignment and connection with a chiropractor is essential for any mom postpartum. Um, I think Pilates, especially reformer Pilates is actually a really great place to start once you past that six to eight week window, because then you're rebuilding the foundation from a strength perspective and strengthening the tissues that have changed. Um, also walking is essential. Um, and squats, you know, most women should, I should say all women should be doing squats prior to the birth anyway, to strengthen the glutes that have been deactivated by sitting all day to make sure that her pelvis is able to work the way it's supposed to and to strengthen her pelvic floor in a healthy way. So those are also things that we wanna to start to work on postpartum. Um, and we don't realize, most people don't realize that relaxin, which is the chemical that helps your body stretch when you're preparing to give birth, stays in your system for up to nine months after you stop breastfeeding. So it is an ongoing healing process, especially for women who have multiple children back to back, you know, Irish twins, or they have about two years and they've just stopped breastfeeding and they get pregnant again. There are some women who will have relaxing in their system for over a decade. So there's a, depending on what your fertility cycle and your birth cycle look like, really focusing on rebuilding those tissues. And as a follow-up to that, we need to be thinking before or at least during pregnancy about upper body strength. Because once you have your baby, you're carrying around an eight to 10 pound human all day, every day, or at least most of it, especially in the first couple of weeks when, while you are exhausted. And that is a resistance activity that most people are not prepared for. So both parties involved, both parents should be starting to think about that and working on some weight training prior to the birth. I love that. That was very, very helpful. Makes my Pilates instructor inside of me very happy. I notice so many women who come to me, you know, maybe past the eight week postpartum mark to start reformer Pilates and they have massive sacroiliac joint imbalances, which is throwing the opposite shoulder off. And a lot of times I'm, I'm meeting with women who have a pretty severe diastasis recti. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Yes. And that's when there are several things to consider. The first is that most women don't realize you have upwards of 24 pelvic floor muscles and at least 14 of them attached to your diaphragm. So that's not only affecting your shoulder, like you mentioned, but also has a major impact on your breathing pattern, which as we talked about earlier, affects your stress level and increases your risk of postpartum depression and postpartum anxiety. Um, so that is where I really do believe that the pelvic floor therapy in particular is such an asset because they focus really specifically on helping create closure for those muscles. But if for some reason, there's no way you can hire a pelvic floor therapist, there's not someone in your area, there's not someone you can reach over telehealth. One of the most important things you can do is activate your transverse abdominus muscle. And I'm sure you talk about this in Pilates, but what it is essentially is you have to pretend that there's a corset in your abdomen, which really there is. Um, and you want to focus on trying to bring the muscle, the muscles on the sides of your belly towards the center and slightly back, not pulling your belly into the, into your spine, but thinking like someone's going to punch you in the gut. And you want to practice that motion first laying on your back and then gradually work into doing it 
through multiple different activities of daily life. And especially for women who have that diastasis recti, meaning that your abdominal muscles have separated during pregnancy, you need that transverse abdominus contraction to protect your belly, first of all, to prevent a hernia, but also to protect your lower back every time you pick up anything. So that's anything from your toothbrush to your cell phone, to the car seat, to the baby. Anytime you are picking up anything or even bending forward, you need to be focusing on that contraction to protect your core and make sure that you don't end up with a new injury. I wish you could be in this room right now to see Bethany. She's like doing a happy dance. She's (laughs) nodding along. She gave you like the preaching arms, like, yeah, perfect. It's so very well explained. That's all so important. Um, I've heard, we mentioned this already and I've heard you um, do an episode about this as well. Tell us about breastfeeding, the importance of breastfeeding after birth. Yeah, you know, that's something that, again, comes down to priorities. And unfortunately, our society prioritizes mom going back to work and being at work and really doesn't allow her the connection time and the bonding time that is involved in breastfeeding, not to mention the nutrient delivery to your child. Of course, there are always possibilities and situations in which breastfeeding becomes difficult or even impossible. And I absolutely respect that. Please, if you're listening to this, do not feel shamed if you've made choices or had to make choices or then forced physically not to breastfeed. However, it is absolutely essential liquid gold that you are feeding your child. It comes back to the example I made earlier about putting unleaded fuel in a sports car. A mom's body reacts to the baby's saliva when a baby is breastfeeding. It literally will cause mom to pass along different antibodies based on the chemical feedback from the baby's saliva so that the baby is getting immune system health. The baby's getting different nutrient delivery and so many other factors that we haven't even measured yet. But moms will tell you if you pump and freeze your breast milk or even have it in the fridge, you can tell when what was going on with your baby or that something different at least was going on with your baby based on the color and the texture and the consistency of the breast milk. And that is the most beautiful miracle to me on this planet. If you are able, you owe it to your baby to breastfeed. Wow. Because it is essential. That is amazing. (laughs) When we opened this conversation up and you said that you are so interested by the human body, like that's amazing. (laughs) That is so cool. No wonder you get so excited about this stuff. It It is so cool, Casey. Wow. Wow. So apparently I can't just go down to the store and buy, a, you know, some drink that's made with a little bit of carbohydrate and fat and protein and feed it and think everything's going to be okay. <laughs> you can, and your baby will be fine because the human body's incredible, but it's better if they can get it directly from you or at least from another mom. It might not be the same antibodies. It might not be the same nutrition because she's not feeding your baby directly, but it's still better than something that's been processed and put on the Mm. shelf with God knows what other kind of additives in it. It's so interesting to me when I have a client come in who maybe doesn't have childcare for her less than six month old. I encourage, obviously, if you can bring your kiddo in, of course, hop on the reformer. We'll have a place for him. Um, But when the baby starts to cry, the mom has no choice but to start to lactate. So her body is, is already responding to the need from that infant that she just created. It's so cool. Yeah. You know, we were designed perfectly and I have a significant amount of respect for the accomplishments we've made in healthcare. Modern medicine is one of the coolest things on the planet. The things that we can do. I mean, there are people out there 3d printing hands for children who are amputees, but (laughs) If the body is allowed to do what the body is able to do, that will trump what science can do any day of the week. 
I love that. That is so well said, and we totally, totally agree. What What is something really surprising that you've learned through your episodes on your podcast, something you may, maybe weren't expecting? Ooh. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Hmm. Yeah. So we actually are releasing tomorrow, uh, well, at the date of recording, anyway, just recently released an episode with Dr. Alice Kirby. She does something, it's somatic experiencing. And it's a kind of therapy that goes into connecting the brain and the body from an exterior perspective. So as a chiropractor, I connect brain and the body through adjustments. I help adjustments help relieve tension on the nervous system, help remove physical stress, help improve that neuroconnectivity, help brain and body talk to each other. What somatic experiencing does from the way she explained it to me is it takes kind of a psychotherapy approach to helping you reintegrate with your body. So asking yourself when you're brushing your teeth, what does this feel like? What am I actually smelling right now? How does my toothbrush feel on my teeth? How much saliva is in my mouth? And being really present with things like that. And that's a grossly oversimplified example. But it was to a point that she blew my mind so much. I had trouble asking her the right questions (laughs) because I was so fascinated. It is a really incredible approach to asking your body what actually feels good? And that's something that people don't think about, but I think is one of the most critical things as a person that you can do is actually sitting down and asking yourself, what feels good? Why does this feel good? What doesn't feel good? How can I avoid that thing that doesn't feel good? Or really should I be trying to figure out why that doesn't feel good and do something about it? I think if we did that, we would notice a significant drop in how we self-stim, you know, whether it's phone, food, sex, drugs, whatever, and really focus on, okay, how do I make my life better? I love that. We will definitely be looking forward to that episode. That sounds very interesting. Um, What what is something that you are either working on or, or really optimistic about for the future? Yeah. So I'm going through a major life transition right now. Um, I'm actually leaving my practice, which was a huge kind of spur of the minute decision, major health move, um, both emotionally and uh, in terms of my personal relationships. And I'm moving to Florida to literal paradise and really reinvesting in my health. Um, so I don't know yet what my journey looks like as a practitioner, um, in terms of physically putting my hands on people, but I'm currently working on, um, business strategy for people in health and wellness careers, because I realized as just as I did earlier in my career, that if I wanted to help kids, I need to help moms, that if I want to help more people, it actually works better if I help the practitioners who are taking care of them succeed and make sure that their lives are balanced and that they're actually getting what they need and that they're not burnt out so that they can continue to take care of those people. So I'm really jazzed about that. Uh, I'm also working on releasing another book. Um, That's my project for the summer and possibly starting a wellness company with my parents because they are prime examples that you do not stop living when you're 50 and you can be incredibly healthy in your sixties and beyond. Wow. That's amazing. We're so much looking forward to that. What a brave step out into the unknown for you. Um, and (laughs) I think, I think you're so right. Focusing on the practitioner makes for so much change. And especially after the year we've had, I mean, my friend, um, is a paramedic in New York city and he was placed a year ago, March, um, 2020, he was placed on a COVID ward and he yes. was front row in New York city to everything that was going down. And he told me privately, like, just wait in the next year or two to see how many people are going to retire from the medical field because they are so burned out. Yeah. Those first line, first line responders still need our hopes, our prayers, our support, physically, emotionally, financially, they are tapped out. Yep. 
Yep. And it's not like all these other, you know, diseases just decided to take a little break and go away. Like people are still really unwell and need other problems for other diseases. So that's, that's amazing. We would love to support you in any way that we can. I have learned a lot from this episode. I've learned a lot from your podcast. It's been really great. What is one thing that you would want a listener to take away from this conversation and apply into their lives? Yeah. Uh, and thank you, because we've gotten to touch on some really incredible topics today in such a wide range. Here's the thing, listeners. You have the power to change your health every single day. There is nothing about your health that you cannot impact in a positive way. You may have something that is chronic or degenerative, and it won't completely go away, but you can change it, and you can change your quality of life. And the only person who lives in your body is you. So it's time to take responsibility for it because no one is going to value your health as much as you. Wow. What a perfect ending. That's amazing. We are so grateful for you and for your work. Where would you like people to go to find you and connect with you? Yeah. My favorite platform is Instagram and it's at happy motivation for women. That's great. We'll make sure we link up to that in the notes. Dr. Chelsea Durda, thank you so much for everything that you do for your content, for putting out such a great podcast and for taking the time to talk with us today. Like I said, I personally learned a ton from this conversation and just thank you so much. So grateful for you. I second that. Thank you you so so much, much, Chelsea. Thank you guys. This was fantastic. Thank you very, very much. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio.